All right, I think we can, uh, we can get started. We are right at 2.31 p.m. Uh, so thank you guys so much for, uh, for coming out to uh, Midwest JS today. Can everybody uh, hear me in the back? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you guys so much for, uh, for joining uh, today. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about why passwords have uh, failed us. So um, I do have a uh, bunch of uh, swag items to give away, so we'll do a quick quiz throughout the, um, throughout the talk, and uh, the person that gets the closest, uh, just come see me after the talk. I'll give you, uh, or I'll just take down your email and send you a code to redeem some um, Azure swag. So uh, to get started, any idea how many uh, credentials have been leaked uh, since 2013? Anybody want to just throw out a number? Three billion? Anybody else? 800 million. Uh, close, but not really. So, uh, 14.7 billion leak credentials that have been made public. So that is a whole lot of uh, username and password combinations, but that is such an astronomical number that you can't really even fathom it. So I have another um, statistic. <coughs> How many of the breaches, how many uh, documents were actually secure breaches, meaning that the data that was leaked, even though it was leaked, it was rendered useless, it was properly encrypted, and basically bad people, malicious actors, couldn't do anything with it. Anybody want to give a percentage? Four? Four? Zero. Zero. Four percent. <laughs> All right, so uh, these stats came from a breach level index, which uh, you might have been on. But that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. So only 4% of um, data breaches since 2013 were properly secured, had the proper, um, proper encryption, proper hashing that, allowed, that basically made the data useless for malicious actors. The other 96%, the other 14.2 billion, uh, had some actionable data that somebody could take and uh, do something with. So that's why today we're talking about why passwords have failed us and three alternatives to authenticating users without having to deal with passwords ever again. Uh, my name is uh, Otto Kukic. I work as a developer evangelist for a company called Auth0. And uh, what we do at Auth0 is provide a universal authentication and authorization platform for web, mobile, legacy applications. So if you don't wanna write another login screen ever again, and you don't wanna deal with all of the complexities of managing user identities, you could check out Auth0 and uh, we could help you with it. Uh, currently we do something like two and a half billion logins per month, so we, we are pretty good at it. But um, that's enough of the, the sales pitch. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about this talk, or if you wanna give me any feedback, you can find me at Cookage Auto on Twitter. I would be happy to engage with you there. And before we get started, I do wanna thank all of our sponsors and organizers for uh, making Midwest JS happen again. So a big uh, shout out and thank you to all of the sponsors. If you guys haven't had a chance to talk to them, um, most of them are downstairs by the, audit um, by the uh, main conference hall. So <coughs> I wanna start this talk with a uh, statement. A and that statement is that traditional password base traditional password-based authentication is antiquated from both a user experience, business efficiency, and also security point of view. So if you're still building modern applications and you're, you're just kind of setting a world. And um, luckily, you know, alternative that we're see if can remove passwords from completely in the, in apps that you build. Password problem. Why are passwords so problematic? And why do we still use them? So, the user experience standpoint. Um, the, you know, the, the first thing from the from a user experience point of view is the average LastPass user has something like 191 passwords in their password vault. And uh, you know, if you are using a manager like LastPass or 1Password, 
you might be considered a power user, you know, having that many credentials. Uh, I logged into my 1Password. Before this talk, and I had something like 160. Um, but my parents are not very all, and I manage most of their online identities, their bank accounts, their uh, 401k, and all of that stuff. And even those credentials alone, for that don't even really use the internet if they don't have to, they have to uh, 50, different, 50 different accounts on different websites that they have to use every single day. So um, the human mind, you know, the humans are not made to remember hundreds and hundreds of different passwords, hundreds and hundreds of different unique combinations, which leads us to um, the next point, password requirements wild, wildly uh, Site. So one website might require eight characters and one special character. Another might require numbers. Another might require, you know, both numbers and alphanumericals, you know, lowercase, uppercase, and all of that stuff. And there's really not a whole rhyme and reason to it. So some just seem completely random. And we'll get to my uh, favorite example there in just a second. But finally, 23% of users admit to having only one password. And the other 77% uh, are liars. But um, <laughs> who here uh, uses 1Password uh, for everything? Who uses 1Password for banking, 1Password for everything else? OK. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I have, you know, I have most of my stuff in 1Password. But whenever I'm signing up for a new account, uh, that I'm not sure I'm going to continue using the app. I just have a, a go-to password that I that I use. Um, so let's kind of look at an example of the worst password requirements that I have ever seen. And this is actually from the uh, state of Nevada Department of uh, Motor Vehicles. And this has been going on for four years. So every single time I've had to renew my license, I've had to deal with this password um, instructions just because I forget the password I set because their um, requirements are very limited. So let's take a look. The password has to be exactly eight characters in length. It has to contain at least one letter, one number, and it has to contain one of the following special characters, so an at symbol, a hash bang, and a dollar sign. But this last one, the password is not case sensitive. <laughs> And so this is what I have to deal with every, every two or so years. And um, I don't even know what, what password you can make of this, but this is very, very insecure. This greatly limits the number of uh, password combinations you can even have. So a malicious actor could very easily generate, you know, eight, uh, eight characters. Uh, I don't, don't want to throw out a number, but it is a very short list um, in the grand scheme of things. But if you are still using passwords, I do want to very quickly cover the passwords do's and don'ts. And these come from the uh, National Institute of Science and Technology, NIST. And um, luckily, this year uh, was the first year that they actually came out with some sensible requirements. And so this organization in the past was the organization that recommended you require special characters, you require uh, all sorts of complexity in your passwords. and. Uh, this year, the, their guidelines changed drastically to make it so that um, we favored the user experience when creating passwords because they found out in their ongoing research that having longer passwords that are easier to remember for the user, much easier to, to compose, is much more secure than having all sorts of weird symbols like replacing uh, letters with numbers and stuff like that. So for the do's, they recommend having a minimum of eight characters for your password, and they also have um, recommend a maximum of 64 characters, although I don't see why that limit should even be there. I mean, you should be able to make as long as you want, but a minimum of eight characters. All special characters are okay, including the uh, space, uh, space character. So uh, this is a new one that I found out last year for the first time that you can actually uh, have spaces in your password, and uh, that kind of blew my mind. And then finally, to prevent common passwords. So, so there's all sorts of uh, SaaS services. There's, there's uh, all sorts of GitHub dictionary lists that you could download of common passwords, like one, two, three, four, five, six, password, let me in, 
et cetera, et cetera, that you should be checking against uh, when a user registers for your application. And uh, they also updated their list of don'ts. So the first one we have here is uh, no composition rules. So don't tell your users how their passwords should be, um, should be created. So don't require special characters. Don't require uppercase, lowercase. Um, remove those rules and just let the user have a long password because they, the longer the password, the, the more secure it, it'll be and harder to crack. No knowledge-based authentication. And uh, so, so this is, um, if you guys have ever had signed up to a service and they had you fill out a number of um, security questions to recover your account, uh, NIST is recommending that we don't do that anymore. And um, a really bad example of this is um, United Airlines. I just signed up for, for an account with them because I flew with them a couple weeks ago. Um, signed up for an account and when I signed up, they had me answer three questions. But what was interesting, rather than giving me a free text box where I could enter my answer, they gave me a check box. So they, they said like, what is your favorite city? Or like, what is your hometown? And then they gave me a list of 50 cities. So if I didn't live in one of those, I kind of would have been you know, sold out of luck. And it was like that for every single question. So I just had to really guess both the question and answer. So if I ever forget my password, I will have to contact support. And then finally, don't expire passwords unless you have a very, very good reason to. And uh, a lot of enterprises will do this where after every 90, 180 days, they'll expire your password and force you to create a new one. And what they found out in the research is uh, what people will do is they'll put their original password and then just add a one and a two and a three and a four and then eventually they'll quit um, the company. So, <laughs> So don't expire passwords unless you have a very, very good reason to do so. Next, let's take a look at why passwords are bad from a business efficiency standpoint. And the first item we have is the technology acquisition and maintenance costs. So with this, you know, it's gonna cost you time and money to implement a identity management system. Whether you go and buy a, an off-the-shelf solution, whether you build it in-house, it's gonna cost you time and money to develop this, to, to maintain it, to run it. You're also gonna have a lot of support and help desk costs associated with people calling in and saying, I need to reset my password, I forgot how to do it, can you help me do it? And then finally, uh, you'll have to set up all sorts of preventative measures within your organization. So what happens in the event of a breach, you, you know, get insurance uh, against breaches, have a backup plan, a backup plan of that backup plan, and everything else that goes into ensuring that your identity management system is up and running and uh, working correctly. And if we just take a look at how this is actually hurting your bottom line, uh, an interesting stat that I found was that from the uh, Gartner Group was um, that they found out that 20 to 50 percent of all support, help desk support calls, emails, live chats are people asking to reset their account. They forgot their credentials, they can't log in, they need their information reset. So that is a whole lot of help desk and support calls that could be avoided if you just didn't have to use passwords at all. And uh, from Forrester Research, they also found out that the average password reset costs a company about $70. So the time to onboard um, help desk support staff, train them, maintain the systems, maintain the phone lines, um, $70. So every single time, 20, 50% of your uh, help desk support calls are costing you $70 on average, which, is, which can get really expensive and, and hurt your bottom line. Um, so, so this is uh, IT generally. <clears throat> and I will be happy to follow up with you afterwards and get you the link to the, uh, to the study if you'd like. Um, so the security implications of um, storing passwords and managing and maintaining uh, passwords in your databases. So first of all, you know, you have to follow all of the security best practices, hash, encrypt, you know, salt and hash all the passwords, make sure that, uh, you know, your, all of your applications are running um, HTTPS, are secure, and uh, all of the best practices to prevent 
malicious users from gaining access to your systems. And uh, if your organizations, if your development team follows all of the best security practices, your application is as secure as, as, secure as it can be. You still have to worry about hardware and software vulnerabilities that come from your vendors that are really outside of your scope of control and uh, that you might be exposed to. So through no fault of your own, you might still have your, uh, your systems uh, invaded and, and data stolen. And then finally, the, the weakest link will always be your users. So dealing with social engineering, if they can, um, if a malicious actor could convince, you know, one of your IT admins or one of your developers to give them the credentials, give them their password, um, then you're going to be in for a world of hurt. So those are the uh, security implications. And um, so it's been about how many days since the uh, last major reported data breach? Any guesses? Three days. <laughs> so we're, we're getting better. <coughs> and uh, so the, uh, the data breach that we had that was widely reported three days ago that affected over 21 million user accounts where uh, their email addresses, passwords, and other personal, personally identifiable information was leaked was um, Cafe Press. So uh, the website where you can go and uh, design a custom T-shirt, they'll print it and, and ship it to you. Uh, they just had a, the, the data breach happened a couple months ago, but it was uh, reported on just a few days ago, three, three to be exact. But Cafe Press is not the only one. You know, we had uh, a huge uh, data breach from the Avast Security, which you would think they would um, have a really, really good security infrastructure. Uh, MyFitnessPal, which is owned by um, Under Armour now, uh, we have Adobe, House, Sony, Bitly, Imgur, Discuss, LinkedIn, Dropbox, all of these major, major organizations that have, over the last couple of years, suffered major data breaches that, had, that have uh, contributed to making that uh, 14 billion number a uh, sad reality. <coughs> so <coughs> another uh, fun, fun question. So stolen passwords account for how many, uh, what percentage of data breaches so for, from these data breaches, uh, there is a certain percentage that accounted uh, that the malicious actors were able to gain access to these databases by using stolen passwords. Anybody want to throw out a number for what percentage of that was? 40? 40? 90. 95. 75. 75. 81. <laughs> so close. So. Um, Again, this is why passwords are bad. If over 80% of data breaches happen due to uh, stolen passwords, whether they are leaked, whether they are socially engineered, key logged, or you know, ill-gotten by other means, that is a very, very scary number. And if we could get rid of 81% of these, that number would go down drastically. So let's uh, talk a little bit about what type of uh, password-based attacks uh, we have to deal with. And um, the first one we'll talk about is key logging. So this could be both software-based or hardware-based, uh, where a malicious actor is able to install some code on your machine, so either a piece of software or a physical key logger on your hardware that tracks all of your keystrokes. Now this is a very, very targeted attack if you're doing it hardware-based, but uh, you know people download stuff from the internet still all the time and uh, key loggers are not are not too uncommon. Next one is uh, brute force attacks. And uh, when it comes to brute force attacks, they are, they have a very, very low probability of working. And basically what happens here is a malicious actor will just spam a login form, trying all sorts of email and password or username and password combinations and see if they can get in. So they'll just spam hundreds and thousands and millions of uh, requests until they, they get their IP blocked or somebody rate limits them. But these, are, these attacks rarely work, but you know, the, even though they have a very, very small percentage of being successful, if they do gain access to a system, then they can do malicious things with it. Uh, credential stuffing is uh, kind of a subset of brute force attacks where uh, malicious actors will take those 14 billion records or however many uh, billion, billions and millions of records we have uh, leaked out there 
and kind of clean up the data, see what is actionable, and just try different credentials, different, um, different combinations to try to authenticate into systems. So this is a more, a little bit more of a uh, targeted attack than a brute force attack. Still has a very, very low odd of, um, very low chances of working. But if, but if it does, you could still um, do a, a whole lot of damage if you log into the, um, the right account. And then finally, um, again, social engineering is probably the biggest and most successful way of breaching, uh, breaching secure systems because humans will always be the, the weakest link um, in, the, in the chain. So if you can uh, convince a, an engineer, a, a receptionist, whoever uh, to give you access to the system, then you don't have to worry about all of these uh, high tech solutions. So how do we uh, protect against password based attacks? So before we uh, talk about the alternatives, uh, let's also briefly talk about how we can, uh, how we can have better and more secure uh, password based systems because the reality of the, the, the re reality of the situation is we are still for a very long time going to be relying on passwords and things are changing things are changing but they are changing very very slowly so the first thing we can do is anomaly detection so um, google does a really great job of this if i were to log in to my gmail account every day from las vegas and Today, I am logging into my Gmail account from uh, Minneapolis. Uh, Google, before letting me in, is going to re-authenticate me. And uh, you know, they might ask me a security question. They might ask me to uh, tap, yes, that's me logging in on my phone. Um, and they'll try to detect anomalies. They'll try to de detect things that are out of place uh, for a specific user. So uh, a lot of companies will give you a, a risk score based on how this user is authenticating, how many failed login attempts they've had. And if something seems out of place, then they are going to alert you. Uh, they might block the login request, require additional information before allowing you to log in. So anomaly detection goes a long way in preventing malicious uh, actors, even if they do uh, capture your, um, your credentials. Uh, breached password detection is kind of a new one that a couple of companies have rolled out, uh, including Spotify. Um, Odd Zero has, has the, the feature built in as well. And uh, basically the way that this works is uh, companies, uh, you know, white hat companies, security companies, they will go out and find these data breaches uh, that have been publicly made available. They'll store the username and password or email and password combinations in their database. And now when your user goes to log in, if they detect that that specific email or username and password combination is leaked, so you know if they have it, then the bad guys, if they can detect that, then they will block the login request and let the user know that their account has been compromised and that they should change all of their passwords if they are still using that specific combination. So breach password detection is kind of a passive way uh, of protecting and alerting users of uh, malicious malicious attacks and, and just letting them know that their data uh, might have already been leaked or might already be available to, to malicious users. Uh, Multi-factor authentication is a major one and, and that one kind of goes hand in hand with anomaly detection. Basically, once the user authenticates, they provide their username and password. Uh, once those are verified, then we send a one-time passcode device or their email or even, uh, you know, if, if we have an MFA app, they can get the push notification, and we can uh, approve that. Approve that that we are who we say we are. We're basically authenticating twice before we're let into the application. And then finally, uh, credential managers help uh, greatly. So, so whether you're using LastPass or One Password, uh, they kind of take some of the the mental strain for the user, uh, where they don't have to remember any of their passwords anymore. They can just uh, store them in this secure vault. And when they need to log in, we'll import them so they're not going to be typing the password out. We don't have to worry about uh, key loggers as much. Or, or, you know, we can have our passwords be completely random. All of my passwords in one password. I have no idea what they are, so I just copy and paste, and I am logged in. So now that we talked about a little bit about why password, why password impact that they have on organizations, both from kind of hurting the desks. Uh, being very difficult to maintain and being the easiest target for 
uh, malicious actors did to exploit, let's take a look at some of the alternatives that we have. And uh, we'll start easy with uh, social connections. And um, social connections, I'm sure you are all, at least some are familiar with, but if you're not, uh, when, we, when we talk about social connections, what we mean is authenticating your users using existing accounts from an OAuth and uh, OpenID Connect compatible provider. And I, I, I always thought that the uh, social connection name for, for, for this type of um, sign-in was somewhat incorrect because when you think social connection, you think Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google Plus, that's not around anymore, but. <coughs> So, so you think of the social networks, but really any organization, as long as it complies with OAuth and OpenID Connect, can allow users to federate from their application into your own. So, you know, you can use Facebook, you can use Google, but you can also use GitHub, you can use PayPal, you can use uh, any sort of application that, that just follows this protocol, implements it, and makes it interoperable with, with other applications. So how it works, when the user comes to your application, they click the sign in screen or the sign up screen. Instead of being presented with a really long registration form to fill in, they're just given a list of social, social providers that they can authenticate with. And here we have Facebook, GitHub, and Google. Depending on the application that you're building, you might only have one or you might have a giant list, but uh, it really depends on who your target audience is, who your users are, um, that'll help you determine which social connections and which social providers to um, interface with. Once you select one, so let's just say we try to log in with Facebook, we're gonna be navigated to, to facebook.com where if we're not logged in, we're gonna have to provide our Facebook credentials there, have Facebook deal with the uh, email and password, uh, you know, all of the security best practices, storing passwords securely, and all of this stuff that, that we just talked about. So Facebook will take care of all of that for us the user will get a consent screen telling them uh, that what, what information from Facebook our application is gonna get. And for the most part, you could just get you know, the email, the, uh, the profile, the username, but you can also ask for additional information such as their likes, their location, their any sort of information that Facebook has collected on the user. And you can click the, uh, the continue button, that's gonna authenticate you, and then you will be in your application. But, um, to, do, to take it a little bit uh, further, l further, let's take a look at how this flow actually works from the OAuth uh, perspective. So if you guys are not familiar with OAuth, there are a couple of talks right after mine that, that go into uh, the basics of OAuth and also how to implement it with uh, Vue.js, but I'll, I'll pitch those at the very end. So let's assume that this is your application. So you have, you're running a traditional application um, and your server's on the back, on the, uh, left hand side and the user comes to your application on the right hand side. Since you are using a social provider, you don't have to worry about any of the user information, any of the uh, passwords. We're gonna delegate that to our social connection. So in this case, I'm gonna use the little Oz0 logo as our social provider. So this could be Facebook, this could be GitHub, this could be uh, Oz0, it could be any, any uh, basically any identity provider that supports OAuth and OpenID Connect. So when the user clicks on the sign in button from your application here, let me move the mouse. So they click sign in, they're gonna be redirected to that third party um, authentication solution. So they're gonna be redirected to Facebook, they're gonna enter their credentials there. And uh, once Facebook is satisfied with that user's credentials, once they can verify who they are, they're gonna send you a callback to your application with a code. And this is gonna be a random string. It might be you know, 10, 20, 30 characters. But it, at this moment, this code doesn't mean anything to your application. It doesn't mean anything to your backend server. It is just a code that Facebook will later use to verify um, that this is a legitimate request. So once this uh, callback URL gets hit in your application, on the browser side of things, nothing happens. This is a regular web application. We don't do any processing server si or client side. So we just pass that code, that, that code parameter, back to our um, server. Our server looks at the URL, looks at the callback, gets the code, and says, okay, this is an authentication request. This user is trying to authenticate from some social connection. Let me send this code back to Facebook saying, I got this code. I think this user is trying to log in. 
is this a legitimate login request? At this point, Facebook is going to get that code, uh, match it up against its database to see what session this is, who the user is. Once it is happy and um, everything is great, it's just going to send back the user information in the form of tokens back to your server. So here you could get uh, all of that user information that you requested. It could be the user's profile information. It could be additional information that you requested, such as their check-ins, their likes, their friends list, et cetera, et cetera. From that point on, you have the tokens. You know who the user is. You just generate a session cookie, store it in the browser, and now your user is authenticated. So you didn't, you don't care about the user's password. That you know, you you will never get their password. You will never get any of the information that they don't want you to have. But you'll be able to know who this user is, get their identity, and be able to um, provide them the, the logged in experience. Now, once the user is logged in. And the way you'll be able to tell this is by them having the active cookie in their browser. Every time they make a request, that cookie gets sent back to the back end. You can verify it. And if the request, if the cookie is still active, it's in your session database, you will serve them the HTML, serve them the page that they requested. And that's kind of the uh, quick three minute uh, explanation of how OAuth with a social provider um, works with the uh, authorization code flow. So what are the pros of using social connections? The first one is allowing users a one-click sign-up experience. So rather than having them fill out a really long form saying, you know, putting in their email address, confirming their email address, uh, getting all sorts of uh, information on them, collecting a, a password from them, you can just have them click, authenticate on, on Facebook, authenticate on Google. They'll come back in your application and you'll have all the information on them. So better experience for them, more data for you. And that brings us to our second point, which is you'll be able to capture better data about the user. You can, instead of asking the user to fill out a form on your website as well, you can just ask them to grant you permission for, grant you permission to the data that they likely already have stored in Facebook, on Twitter, or whatever provider you're using. And then finally, the biggest pro is that you delegate account verification to a third party. So you are no longer worried about how the passwords are stored, where they're stored, if they're complex enough. You let Facebook, you let Google, you let Twitter deal with all of that. They have huge teams that, that you know, worry about the authentication process. And you and your organization can focus on building technologies and building software that is you know, relevant to your business and not kind of reinventing the wheel with um, identity and authentication. But with pros, there are always cons. So what are the cons of using social authentication? And the first one is that your user may not be using the social provider that you want them to. So if you only provide login with Facebook and your user doesn't use Facebook, deleted their account a couple years ago, then they're not going to sign up for your application because they don't want to go through the process of signing up for a Facebook account just to be able to sign up for your application. So you'll really have to um, either offer a number of different uh, providers that the user might use or do a whole lot of research to see where your users are coming from so that you can give them the experience that uh, suits them. You're also reliant on, third party, uh, on a third party for authentication. So if Facebook decides tomorrow to turn off uh, login with Facebook, then you're kind of sold out of luck and you'll have to come up with a replacement for it. So you do delegate a big part, you know, identity and access management is probably one of the biggest parts of any application. So if you are relying on a third party for it, there is always that, you know, however small risk that uh, they might turn off access or they might start charging for access, in which case you, you really have to plan for that. And then finally, um, account linking and additional maintenance is required. So if Facebook or Twitter changes the way that they want to do this, uh, you know, changes the way that the implementation works, then you'll have to uh, just kind of go along with their API. And uh, they don't make changes too often, but th there have been breaking changes. Last year, LinkedIn uh, changed a couple of things with their social login, and we kind of had to scramble to, to get it fixed. Um, but yeah, so, so you will have that additional maintenance. You will have to stay on top of what the other social providers are doing to make sure that you can, um, you can continue to provide a good experience for your user. And also, you'll probably want to support account linking if you are allowing users to log in with multiple providers because there's nothing worse than a user coming back to your application and 
you know, say initially they sign up with login with Facebook, the next time they log in with Twitter, and even though it's the same email address or the same username, now they have two different accounts with two different sets of data, and that's not good for you, it's not good for the user experience. So having some sort of account linking allowing you to merge multiple social accounts into one within your application would be a, a really good feature to have. So is social uh, login for me? So I just wanted to share a couple of stats on uh, what, what users uh, think about social logins. So the first one is um, that 86% of users report being bothered by having to create a new account on a website that they just went to. And I'll, you know, I definitely fall into this crowd if, if, it's, um, if it's a brand new application that I'm not sure what it does or I'm not sure if I'm gonna keep using it Unless there's a very good reason for me to sign up for an account to, to get access to it, I probably will not do it. But if I can just one click, you know, sign in with Facebook, I might give it, might give it a second thought. Then 88% of users will enter incomplete or false information on registration forms. So if you do have a traditional registration form, uh, there is a very high likelihood of the user entering incomp incomplete data just to kind of rush through the registration process to gain access to your application. And uh, with the social provider, you kind of eliminate that unless they just want to have false information within that social provider as well, which really wouldn't make too much sense. But uh, yeah, users will always kind of take the easy and quick way out just to get access to your application. And then finally, 92% of users will leave a website instead of resetting their password. So if they're not using a, a password manager and they forget what their login is, rather than being bought, set their password, deal with you know that whole situation unless it's something very important or urgent for them they will application and you won't get the the revenue or um, you know you won't get them on, on your application so you won't get those usage statistics so that's social login and that's something that uh, most people are you know by this point pretty familiar with have very likely used it in the past but uh, the next one I want to talk about is passwordless and passwordless authentication is, um, allows you to authenticate users with a uniquely generated one-time passcode or magic link. So your users will still enter an email address when they go to authenticate or a phone number, but instead of entering a password right away, you're gonna email them or text them a password that they're gonna use for just that login, for, that, for just that login session. The next time they come back to log in, the same thing's gonna happen. You're gonna send them a new one-time password or a new link to authenticate again for that session only. So the way it works is user comes to your website, they click sign up or sign in, they enter their password and in the, or they enter their um, email address. And in this case, uh, I'm just showing the email example. So we'll put, and then I get an, um, an email at osiro.com with my code being 505. So now I go back to my application, that email address is a password in 5053, and I am authenticated. The next time I again, that code is gonna be different, and I'm gonna authenticate, um, re-authenticate new code. So very, you're not storing anything that you are storing is uh, for the time, you know, it might be three minutes, it might be five minutes, code to validate that the request did come from a certain come from a certain user and if that code matches up they can authenticate so what are the uh, pros of passwordless authentication the first one is no passwords to set manage or remember by the user every single time they go to authenticate they go to log in they're going to be given a password or to make things even simpler just a link to click in their email um, in their email client to be authenticated. Next, you're gonna have greatly reduced maintenance costs because you are not going to be required to salt and hash those passwords. You're not gonna be required to store them. You're just sending unique passwords every single time a user tries to authenticate. And then finally, you'll have slightly better security against data breaches because if your database is breached, there's no passwords there. So you know that the malicious actors, they might get access to the user's email address or their phone number, but they're not gonna be able to gain access to their application, to your application. When it comes to the, uh, the cons of passwordless is that the user 
will be required to have access to either their phone or their email client. And the user experience can be a, a, you know, somewhat hindered by the fact that now they have to open up a new tab, go into their Gmail account, get that magic link, go back to their application, paste it in. But it is much more secure, but on the, on the, uh, on the flip side, the user experience, it leaves tired. And then you also have reliance third-party services. So you're very unlikely to be building your own email, you know, your own email system or your own SMS delivery system. So you'll likely be using, you know, like SendGrid or Twilio or uh, SaaS services like that, passcodes. And uh, if for whatever reason the Twilio API is down and you can't send the SMS messages, then your users cannot log in. And then finally, there are the security implications of using the email address or a phone number as a unique identifier for the user. So <clears throat> in case that um, you know, phone numbers might get recycled, email addresses don't, uh, most providers do not recycle email, email addresses anymore, but phone numbers definitely can be. So if um, a user does sign up with a specific phone number and they cancel that phone number and somebody else gains access to it, then they could potentially log in and you wouldn't, you wouldn't know or, or be able to d differentiate between the users. And also just having a, an unchangeable uh, unique identifier for a user isn't the, the greatest security practice, but uh, it is something that, that is manageable. And uh, so passwordless in the wild, I think one of the, uh, the best companies that, that does passwordless is Slack. So when you, whether you download the Slack app or you use Slack on your desktop or laptop, log in, instead of putting in your Slack username and password or email address and password, you could just get this magic link. So you put in your send me a magic link. They will send you a, an email. You click that email and you get a list of all of the channels that, that you belong to and you can choose which ones to log in. So you don't have to remember a password as long as you have access to that email address, you are good to go. And then finally, the third alternative and kind of the newest and most promising one is called WebAuthn, uh, which stands for Web Authentication. Yes? Um, um, any real examples? So we got one. <laughs> so uh, web authentication, web authn. So this is, um, web authn is really part of an overarching spec called uh, FIDO2, which is uh, comprised of web authn and CTAP, which stands for uh, Client to Authentication, Authenticator Protocol. And it aims to make passwords a thing of the past uh, completely. So the way that this works is, uh, you authenticate your users with public key, public key cryptography uh, that has a whole bunch of uh, phishing protocols built in, uh, phishing protections built in to really allow users to authenticate with cryptography and computer magic and what computers were made to do instead of relying on brains to memorize passwords. So if you have ever used a website and you got this little pop-up here, saying use your security key with the uh, we're on, it's very likely that they had implemented WebAuthn. And to show you a little bit deeper how it works, uh, this is a very, very simplified diagram. So basically, you have your browser where the authentication process is gonna happen. You have the relaying party, which could be a social provider, it could be your identity server, it could be your basically where the user is gonna authenticate from. And then the user has an authenticator. So this could be a uh, physical YubiKey device or like a Google Titan device. It could be their phone. It could be a biometric uh, fingerprint scanner on their device. Any sort of uh, hardware that can generate private and public keys um, and basically run cryptographic functions can be used as a, um, as a security key. So basically, to show you how this works, I created a quick little demo. So let's see here. 
<coughs> so to get started, you would first register your user. So we'll just put in my username as, um, as the user. And then I will click the register. Click register. What's going to happen is we're going to take that user a cryptographic challenge within the browser. So within the Chrome, we'll just generate a random string of characters and server or the uh, relying party. Uh, uh, the relying party, the authentication server, is going to capture that. to say, OK, this user is trying to log in or register. And here's the challenge that, um, that was generated for it. It's going to send that challenge back. And we're going to send that challenge to our authenticator, so to our authentication service. In this case, I'm just using my phone. So I got the challenge, and my uh, Google Pixel popped up saying, uh, would you like to use your uh, security key with uh, webauthn.me to authenticate and create an account? So I will say yes. I'll use my, uh, my, my fingerprint, my fingerprint scanner as the uh, verifier. It recognized my fingerprint. And then uh, from that fingerprint action, we got the, the signature. We got the, the challenge back and my user information, sent it to the browser, and then the browser forwarded it to the relying party. The relying party captured this, verified that that challenge was all good, and then it responded back to the browser saying, OK, I have your information. I have your, um, your public key. I have the signature that you sent me. I have the solved challenge. Your user is created. So now let's try and uh, log you in. So. <coughs> Again, I go, I have my raw user ID and I have my public key that was generated. You know, none of this was done by me. It was all done just by my fingerprint and the cryptography uh, APIs within our browser. So we have that. And now we're ready to authenticate and log in. So we'll hit next. We'll paste our ID, say we're using the public key, and hit the login button. So from here, we are just sending our username, so our raw user ID, or just our uh, username that we had earlier, sending it to the relying party. The relying party is going to figure out from that username what, that, what the raw ID was, as what we saw above, and it's going to send a new challenge back to the browser. The browser is going to get it, send it to our authenticator. In this case, it's going to be my fingerprint again. So I will get the pop-up saying to, you know, let's verify your identity, scan my fingerprint. That works. I have the challenge and the signature sent back to the browser. The browser sends that to the relying party. The relying party finally validates me and sends the user information, my avatar, my username, email address, anything else that I used to sign up with to the browser, and now I am authenticated. So in this scenario, I know this was kind of a a complex and long-winded example, but this kind of showed the entire flow of how WebAuthn works. Uh, the good part is you as developers are not going to have to go through this uh, step every time. A lot of companies, whether you're using Duo or Auth0 or Okta or you know whatever uh, third-party provider you're using, we're going to have SDKs that will allow you to really simplify this into a couple of lines of code to do this automatically for you because you shouldn't have to know all the ins and outs of cryptography to have WebAuthn working. So, where are we? <coughs> but if we do want to look at a, a code sample, uh -oh. so, oh, there we go. We're almost there. So to, to take a brief look at a code sample, uh, we have uh, how to register a user. And as you can see here, we're just using navigator.credentials.get to register. Or this is to authenticate a user. So let's take a look at how to register a user. Again, we're using the navigator. So we're using the built-in APIs within our Chromium browsers. And uh, Edge, Chrome, and Firefox all support this today. Um, Safari has it in beta, so it should be ready uh, by the time the next uh, Mac OS update rolls out. So to register a user, we basically just tell it where to go, where the relying party is, create that challenge, create the user information that we want, 
send it over, and then uh, pass the, the, the public keys back to our um, back to our authenticator. Same thing to authenticate a user. Uh, using the navigator, all the code is there. Again, we're just verifying the challenge. Once everything is good, go back to the relying party, get the user information, otherwise uh, alert and say that, that we failed. So pros of using uh, WebAuthn. Again, no passwords to set, manage, or remember by the user at all. It is built on open standards for interoperability. So regardless of what security key you want to use, uh, as long as it supports WebAuth and as long as it supports FIDO2, you will be able to use it. So you know, it might be your fingerprint on your phone, might be the, the touch bar on your Mac OS, it might be a physical authenticator that, that you bought and, and used. And then finally, it relies on public key cryptography to do this whole dance of authentication instead of having the user remember anything. So they'll just come there, put in their name, put in their email address, verify with a, with a swipe or a tap or a inserting the key and they'll be authenticated. And then the cons are uh, currently the account recovery is limited and difficult. Basically, if you, you, you lose your security key, you're, you've lost that account forever. But <clears throat> the good news is that you can have multiple security keys registered to a single user. So if you do happen to change your phone or lose your physical device, if you set up multiple security keys, you'll still be able to authenticate. So don't use just one, um, I guess the, the uh, rule of law is to not just have one security key because if you do lose it, it is almost impossible to, to get that account back. Uh, there are a couple of drafts on how to deal with this, but the, the spec is still fairly new, so we're still working through a lot of that. Um, it's not very widely supported, especially for legacy systems. So if you are using you know, latest Chrome, latest Edge, and uh, your infrastructure is fairly modern, you have nothing to worry about, but if you do have to support legacy versions of IE or legacy infrastructure systems, then uh, WebAuthn might be might not be a good use case for you. And then finally, physical keys can be stolen. Uh, there's no, uh, unless, uh, so if you have like your fingerprint, that, that's fairly secure, but if you are just using a hardware token and somebody steals it and knows your username, then they'll be able to authenticate into your application uh, as you, without you even knowing it or being able to do much about it other than uh, revoking that, that specific key. So WebAuthn use cases, um, it's a fairly new standard. It was just ratified in March of this year, but Dropbox has already enabled WebAuthn as a second factor for their, um, for their account systems. Uh, but again, the W3C recommendation was published in uh, early March, so we're, companies are still building SDKs for it, are still figuring out really good use cases and slowly rolling it out to, to their different applications. But the good thing is there are a lot of demos and SDKs in the works. So if you go to webauthn.me, uh, you can see a demo that, that we built and basically the demo I just showed uh, in the video a few minutes ago. So if you're interested in trying it out yourself, seeing how it, how it works and just getting some more information about it, that would be a really good starting point. And let's summarize since we only have a couple of minutes. So traditional password-based authentication is antiquated and insecure for a lot of use cases. You know, all the modern attacks are kind of attacking password-based systems and if you can get rid of the passwords, you can uh, save yourself a lot of time. Uh, there are three viable alternatives to password-based authentication. So we talked about social connections, we talked about <coughs> passwordless authentication and the new WebAuthn standard. And then finally, no system is ever gonna be flawless. So consider your specific use cases, consider your users before making the, making the switch and kind of going all in on passwordless or going all in on social connections. Usually, you know, the best bang for your buck is gonna be some sort of mixture of, you know, having passwords as a backup, offering passwordless, maybe implementing WebAuthn, but it'll all depend on, <coughs> on your specific use cases, what your users are, are expecting and accustomed to. Couple of additional resources, if you guys wanna try that WebAuthn demo for yourself, the URL is there. If you wanna learn more about passwordless, we have a uh, link that, that, that kind of explains the difference between SMS and magic link based uh, passwordless. And then if you just wanna learn more than you have ever wanted to about identity, we launched a new uh, totally free, like five hour video series on learning identity. But since you're already at Midwest JS, we do have a couple of great talks right after this one. Uh, one is on uh, securing Vue.js applications with OpenID Connect and OAuth. So if you're a Vue developer, 
uh, interested in learning more about Vue and interested in learning how to authenticate into your Vue applications, Bobby is doing a talk in uh, downstairs actually, um, right after this talk in, uh, in four minutes. And uh, if you don't want to leave rooms, uh, Joel Lord here is doing an uh, intro to OAuth for software developers. So if you just want to get the basics of OAuth, learn why it's a, it's a good um, why it's a good alternative, why you want to use it, stick around uh, right after this talk in this room. And with that said, uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, if you want these slides, uh, bit.ly midwestjs-auto will get you a direct link to the slides and some additional information. Uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, I know we only have a couple of minutes, so I'll try to take a few, but uh, if you want to follow me at Kukichado or talk to me afterwards, I will be here all day and tomorrow. And with that said, uh, my winner for the uh, t-shirts, uh, come on up and uh, we'll send you some swag. Thank you guys. Thank <laughs> you.